Okay, so um, which one? So let me give a, just a broad presentation of the topic before we go into detail. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so this is the idea. So it is really widely held and argued in the philosophy of quantum uh, uh, gravity circle that the concept of philosophical implication of uh, the disappearance of space-time at the fundamental level um, has some sort of impact uh, to the way in which metaphysics is done traditionally, especially for that kind of metaphysics which is really very much grounded on very strong assumption about the nature of space and time. Um, so in this talk, I'll be focused on the, I would say, the metaphysical lesson that I want to derive from the physical, the physical content of string theory and from its formal apparatus. And, and I will be focused on uh, a, some specific, I mean, uh, some, um, a school of thought about the metaphysics of space and time, uh, which is um, focused on the Lewis thesis of modal realism. It's a big word, so let me be more precise. I mean, what do I mean and what features of modern realism I'm taking consideration? Um, so this is the idea, still broadly speaking. If the string theory, um, physical lesson about non-fundamentality no, okay. non of space-time is plausible, uh, what should we conclude about the status of the Lewis thesis of modern realism? Um, so, I mean, Really, this is an informal presentation. I mean, informally speaking, about Lewis in this slide. Possible word, a possible word is considered by Lewis to be some sort of collection, some sort of fusion, I'm, I'm quoting from him, of parts, a kind of minimal collection, something which is the least inclusive one. And the, uh, the distinctive features of this collection is that um, it is a, a somehow the latter is entirely unified by spatio-temporal relations among all these parts. And uh, let's say that string theory, a physical scenario of space-time and fundamentality, somehow poses, a, seems at least to pose a problem to, for Lewis model realism, for reasons that we are going to see in a minute. But um, I want to clarify to what extent this claim is accurate. I want to make a more accurate claim because this is still too broad. And so um, we may find out, actually, that uh, the way in which string theory supports non-fundamentality of space and time um, is far from, it's far from rejecting Lewis model realism. Uh, actually, it might provide some sort of stra some strategy to revise uh, the kind of conceptual framework. Um, at least some of the future of the Lewis conceptual framework. <clears throat> so, um, I want to give you, so far so good. Okay, so this was the, the broad introduction. So, my presentation uh, ideally will be in three blocks. In the first blocks, I mean, I'm here giving for granted something, and probably some of you are wondering. I'm saying, well, the, the metaphysical lesson of string theory about the non-fundamentality of space-time, this is not a very popular thesis in the, in the quantum gravity circle. Um, not many people think that string theory is background independent. I do, and I argued in favor of that in one of my previous works. Um, but maybe in this room, there might be people who don't agree with that. So uh, the idea is to um, at least to start to, I don't say convince you that there is a lesson about no fundamentality of space-time uh, in string theory, but at least to, to show you in what sense we can speak about no fundamentality of space-time according to string theory. Um, I would say that there is really a, a, a way to read into the formal articulation of the theory that says even more than, I mean, about the, uh, the non-fundamentality. It says that even if you want to posit a fundamental geometry, this fundamental geometry has no, doesn't play any explanatory causal role in um, accounting for the manifest geometry of the world. So it's a very strong theory it's a very strong um, scenario. Um, 
Uh, so the idea that is that really the manifest geometry of the world, um, if you read into the formalism and into the physical content, it seems to be really much more a, a, a mechanical byproduct of underlying string dynamics, uh, whose unfolding may require just a topological structure, which is not metrical, something much more weak than a metrical structure, than a space-time structure. Um, of course, uh, we will have the problem to define what does it mean mechanical explanation in this context. So we are trying to, for reasons that I will, I'm going to explain, we are trying to apply um, the paradigm of mechanical explanation to explain space and time. And this might sound like a vicious circle, for reasons which are also historical, connected to the use of the notion of mechanical explanation. Okay. Uh, good. Um, then the second part of the presentation will be, well, once, we, once I convinced you that there is a lesson about space-time background, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, space-time background independent in string theory, oh, uh, I want to say um, something more about how this, um, this is, uh, can be shown by using um, one formal feature of the theory, which is the local structure of the string theory model space. So I will say something really mm, simple about model space, why they are useful, and some of the, uh, the things that you can see here, I hope I'll be able to cover at least each of them, to show you how we can really formulate, um, how we can see um, in which way the model space, locally speaking, can encode information about physical space time. And, and this is still part of the, it's a continuation of part two. So we will need not only the topology, the local topology on the moduli space, but also we will need to look a bit to some structure of fiber bundle on the top of the moduli space. And this will be the final conclusive chapter showing this uh, um, background independence that I'm supporting. Um, okay, so finally, does string theory uh, lesson suggest a problem from Lewis moral realism? So this is Lewis moral realism. It's a, a complex, complex. In, I mean, issue. Okay, it's not just something the plurality of the words. So um, he accepted this controversial ontology for the sake of what he considered to be some theoretical uh, benefits. Uh, and we know that one of the most famous benefits is uh, the application of the thesis of the plurality of the words to modality. Now, this presentation, I cannot really analyze exhaustively the Lewis approach, at least not in this presentation. This will be developed in the paper that I will, uh, will contribute for the, for the volume. Uh, but I want to say some, some of the future that I'm taking consideration here. And to create, I mean, uh, so, I, and I'm not really, really concerned with sophisticated exegetic issues, what David Lewis, David Lewis really said or not said. It's not an interpretation of David Lewis, strictly speaking. Um, so, um, I, I'm going to consider some feature of David Lewis' approach, possible world internally unified by space-time relation, trans-world isolation, um, and I really am attempting for now to understand what of this really view, Delta Shang, uh, can be preserved, and what instead should be revised, and what it should just go in light of the physical content of string theory. If you think that string theory is a plausible uh, is approach to quantum gravity. Um, okay. So let me start. Um, uh, one of my interlocutors also is here in this room because I will be also quoting a, a, a very nice paper of by Christian Woodrich, 2015. He wrote something on uh, the same topic, but you were not thinking to string theory specifically, and so you were mentioning causal set theory. And, and so, yes, you will be one of my main interlocutors in, in this presentation. Okay, so um, let's start with, so we are back to chapter one. So we say four chapters, four short chapters. Okay, um, right. So I'm going to be very fast. Space-time, uh, non-fundamentality, how, how does it work? How, well, I, I didn't want to use uh, string theory formalism, okay? And I thought that just to understand the logic underlying the way in which string theory shows 
um, space time non fundamentality um, we really need to take it's it's sufficient to consider a case of the system of the classical system a pre relativistic system and you can see that there are ways of reading classical hamiltonians like these ones that can mm, bring us to um, to read uh, the emergent nature of space and time. And this is exactly the kind of story that string theory is telling in a more extreme way. Because in, in the case of string theory, the manifest image of the world produced is really far apart from the actual structure of the world. But let's say something more. I just want to give you um, a snapshot, um, really a, a brief understanding of this logic. So if you have a classical Hamiltonian like this, in which there is just, now I'm this, it's really simplified. And you have a Euclidean magic, so you are assuming that there is a system of the particles floating around in this Euclidean uh, space, okay? So you are positing a Euclidean space here since the start. Uh, you say, well, how this world described by this Hamiltonian would appear to us? And when I say appear to us, I don't mean psychological appearances, really by means of measurements, okay? By means of, um, yeah, measurements and experiments. Well, you would say, well, I look to the Hamiltonian, I look to the potential, and we say, well, this is a three-dimensional Euclidean world. Let's assume there is no time, and let's assume this world has no quantum mechanics in it. But why is this? Why, looking to this Hamiltonian, you would say this is a Euclidean three-dimensional world? Well, because if you look to the potential energy there, which is appearing, you can see that that potential energy is a, um, it's an explicit, explicit sorry, function of, uh, of uh, the three-dimensional Euclidean distances, and the potential dictates how any material interaction occurs. So you might say, in this sense, well, look, these interactions, which are encoded in the potential, make that Euclidean distances manifest. So it's producing a manifest image of the world. Um, mm, so in this case, we are lucky because we posited, we, we have an actual world, we are sure that we have an actual world with an Euclidean metric, and we have an Hamiltonian which is producing a manifest image of the world and that coincide with that. Okay, but what if the manifest image of the world does not coincide with the actual geometry of the world? I mean, a more complicated situation. And you, probably some of you already know, I wrote this on, on, on this story um, in, in one of my previous work. So there is another story by Poincaré, um, the, the possible geometrical mismatch between actual um, structure of the background and manifest structure. And basically, um, according to Poincaré, the issue couldn't be really settled by means of empirical evidence. Uh, he was of course, talking about the epistemology of geometry, we are using that parable here in a completely different context. Um, we want to gain a, les a lesson about physics. So um, the, the idea, I don't know how many of you know the parable of the disk, but it's basically, it's, it was an imaginary disk in which you have the, the one that contributes by means of effect of sp spatial variation of the temperature on the length of measuring rows. So the inhabitants were unaware of this um, hidden dynamics affecting the road leg, lens. And so they started to make their measurement, their dynamical generalization, and they um, basically conclude that they were living in a, in a Lobachevsky plan. When, I mean, uh, according to the truth, the actual structure of the disk was Euclidean. But because there were these hidden dynamics, the kind of outcome uh, of their measurement were producing a manifest image of the world that wasn't coinciding with the Euclidean actual structure of the world. Well, you would say, well, uh, the dynamics are producing a manifest geometry of the world that does not coincide with the actual one. Okay, cool, that's interesting. So we can take this parable as a suggesting something like, well, what if in my Back at the Hamiltonian that we saw earlier on, instead of taking a flat Euclidean space, I'm just considering an arbitrary curved space time. And now things would be different. This is how the Hamiltonian would look like. You, I mean, now we don't have a unique way to define the element the ds. And so, um, but you can see that. Um, uh, 
here, the interactions among particles described by the potentials can be seen as manifesting a nucleidion flat space geometry because the, you can always uh, have, uh, by means of local coordinate transformation. And so uh, the world in which we are living now, although it is curved, uh, appears to us as a flat and nucleidion because the Hamiltonian is doing this work of producing the manifest image of the world. This is the logic underlying a part of the string theory argument. So this is not everything about background independence in string theory. Uh, so you see, I didn't even mention uh, the word string here. I was really just, so the, the point is that you can always, uh, I mean, there, there are two ways in which you can read the classical Hamiltonian. This way, in terms of thinking to the manifest image of the world as a mechanical byproduct, but you can also be, well, I, I think that actually the geometry is some, it's some, uh, the metric is some sort of prior uh, feature of the background, which is fixed uh, prior to the dynamics. It, the point is that, that in classical mechanics, these two uh, interpretations do not, are not really distinguishable. It's really a matter of taste. But when you move, you transit it to the quantum gravity realm, then these two description of the Hamiltonian, this way of reading the Hamiltonian, which is then the quantum Hamiltonian in, that, in the quantum gravity case, think to quantum mechanics. You don't even need to go to quantum mechanics, uh, to quantum gravity. Uh, you have really that these two way of reading fall apart. I mean, they, they are really different and they produce a very different conclusion. So um, the moral of the story delivered by quantum string theory, which I told by using a classical story, is really showing that, look, um, it seems to me the space-time geometry here seems, whatever you posit, has nothing to do with the actual background structure. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the manifest image of the world has nothing to do with the actual uh, back, background structure of the world that you might posit. Um, it really seems to be a kind of mechanical emergent byproduct. And so um, um, maybe the fundamental structure of the world is not geometrical at all. We only need some sort of uh, topological structure, some differential structure, some, something weaker. Um, so of course, I want to, I have to skip here. Let me check. Yes, I have to skip here. So there is a controversial issue about the use of mechanical explanation. This will be in the, my slides anyway, uploaded because what does it mean to use the mechanical explanation for explaining space and time when traditionally mechanical explanation requires space and time um, as part of, as the list of ingredients that you use. Think to the notion of initial condition, which is the state of a system um, in space and time. I mean, as, um, so it seems like we really need an extension of the notion of mechanical explanation here, but I cannot, I won't have time to go through this. So. Um, at this point, I will, um, 10 minutes, right? Oh, how much? Uh, 13, 12 minutes. 12 minutes, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> then, <laughs> okay, so the second chapter is, well, look, um, what does it mean that the, 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 the string tier, I mean, the model space is encoding some information about um, space, physical space time. Well, a model space is, uh, it, it has not been created in string theory. It comes from uh, technique of algebraic geometry. Uh, it's a space of parameters. It's a space that uh, simply uh, parameterizes any object you want, a geometrical object, a living object. Um, and so in this case, the way in which it is used in, in a string theory is, in at least the way in which I use it, um, is parameterizing physical space times. It by itself is not a physical space time, it's, but it is parameterizing family of physical space time. What kind of families? Well, um, let's say uh, families which are um, made of space times which are somehow similar to each other, magically speaking. They are distinct, but they are, they differ from each other. So they are grouped, they have something in common, but not everything in common. The metric is the form. And so you, they are, these families that are taking consideration are magically inequivalent, but um, I want to be uh, focused only on those which are magically inequivalent, but still uh, diffeomorphic. Okay, so, um, and then 
if you, um, I won't have time to show you too many details on how you build a memory space out of this um, family of space times. Uh, but once you do this and you have the topological structure of the space of parameters, uh, you can put on the top of this model space a fiber bundle that will give you a fiber bundle in which, so basically this is the, the idea, the Velta shell. So you consider any quantum string system arbitrary, okay? And you um, take, let's assume that as you do in quantum mechanics, right? So if you are um, taking the set of observables, uh, like in quantum mechanics, and what do you have, mm, well, if it's, if you have observable, you have expectation values, okay, in order which are the outcome of measurements. And so the idea is to show that uh, when you have a quantum system uh, against a certain space-time background, let's call it lambda, and you look to the, the structure of fiber bundle of the system of observable of that system against that background, you, you have that the expectation values of your observable will be some number. Okay, we'll, we'll produce some value. Now you can, what I, 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 I did, what I showed in one of my previous work was that there are ways in which you can modify the, the metric of the space time. And so moving, taking a walk over the model space, right? Because the model space uh, is really a space of points and each point corresponds to a space time with a metrical structure, point one, space time one, point two, space time two. And we are thinking to very, very close points, okay? So these are really infinitesimal neighbors. And so there is a way to show that um, you can take your walk over this model space along certain path, paths. And you can see that um, as lambda is changing the metrical structure, lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, uh, the expectation values of these uh, observables do not change. And so the string physics do not detect the metrical inequivalence. But this is not, and this, I mean, if it were just that, then you would say, wow, we have full background independence here. This is absolutely great. But that's not so, not so fast. Um, this is true under certain constraint. And the constraint is that you have to move, you have to take your work going from fiber to fiber, but all these fiber must have the same differentiable underlying structure. And so that, that, that is somehow is making people think, um, at least me, <laughs> think that, well, strings are blind to metrical differences, and, um, but the, I mean, there might be some, um, I mean, this is string dynamics might unfold in some topological non-metrical structure underlying the space-time metric. Um, now I basically uh, summarize the, the two and three, so because I was concerned, but still have 10 minutes, right? No, eight minutes. <laughs> okay, so, um, so now the point is, okay, uh, you can see here, um, well, we also have discussions. So see if you want to know more, I can just come back, right, on, on this. And so, since we, I have eight minutes, I want to, uh, this is a whole how, how I deform, how um, I can really, it's a practically show how you can deform a metrical structure of space time. Uh, well, think, I mean, I can be very, really very simple in explaining that. Take an object, take this glass, you break the glass, the glass on the wall and uh, on the floor, and then you want to re reconstruct your glass with all the pieces, right? And so, and one time you reconstruct the glass putting the pieces with a certain spatial arrangement, and then you break again and you reconstruct this with another special arrangement of all these parts. Every time you get something which it looks like the, the glass before, but it's a bit different. Um, this is the forming. The only difference is that. The only thing is we have to be careful that the deformation I'm taking in consideration here are smooth, so I'm not breaking anything. And I'm not taking wild walk over the model space. I'm not going from one side to the other. I'm moving very, I'm moving around the local area regions in which the change of metrics is not really abrupt or you don't, it, it doesn't break anything, okay? It's like, um, uh, okay, so, um, 
And so all these slides are to show you how, I mean, it's a compact, compactify, I, I'm jumping a hugely technical issue here. And so um, uh, you said uh, eight, right? Se seven, okay. Uh, <laughs> let me think. Uh, yeah, well, you know, you might wonder at this point, I mean, this, this is the Kodairo Spencer map. You see he, here, you might wonder, what is this H1 key zero T? No worry, because what you have here is that you have the tangent space to the moduli space on the left, and you have a vector space which is parameterizing all the possible metrical deformation of the first order of a space-time metric. And there are very nice property of the map, like subjectivity, that let you know, that gives you an idea of how much powerful is the local structure of the moduli space, because it really encodes everything, everything you pick there is, uh, is coming, oh, sorry, well, okay. I don't know. Everything you pick, is that the pointer? No, okay, sorry. So everything you pick in the H1 is coming from the, the tangent space to the moduli space. But okay, let's close this. Um, the, the third block was how does it work when you take a walk on the memory space? And if you take the right walk, you can see background independence. Am I, maybe this is a bit too much sketchy, but okay. So um, I want to, since I want to cover everything, let's jump this and then we will have time to come back. And now you say, you may wonder, yeah, but what this has to do with, well, David Lewis. Um, well, um, as I said, um, we have a, a, a things, right? Lewis 1987. So we have that the definition of the identity of a Lewis possible world must contain something absolutely crucial, right? The way in which how do you distinguish a collection of fact of things from a world, a possible world in Lewis? Well, um, they are unified by a spatiotemporal structure, and so. Um, so this is absolutely important and suggests that space and time are fundamental. But at least according to my reading of David Lewis, the idea is that the fundamental in the Lewis sense of word identification, so he's saying spatiotemporal relation are fundamental to identify a collection of, a collection of things as a, a possible word, okay? This use of the word fundamental is not exactly, I mean, really, strictly speaking, the same use of the word fundamental done in string theory and in quantum, in, in quantum gravity. Because, in, I mean, in the case of fundamental in quantum gravity, it's a notion which is grounded on, on the notion of physical length scale, right? It is fundamental. Uh, fundamental dynamics um, occur uh, below a certain threshold where ordinary notion of space and time breaks down. And the, the, the former, I mean, the, the, the conceptual framework of David Lewis that really doesn't really explicitly refer to a, an idea of fundamentality in terms of the quantum scale. It seems here that the way in which he speaks about uh, fundamentality, I mean, as I understand here is, and has more to do for word identification purposes. And um, I mean, uh, in, within this framework, there aren't any explicit constraint in Lewis ruling out that these words may be emergent. So the, the Lewis pluriverse, um, it might be an emergent entity. And you don't really need to have a fundamental a view that space-time are the fundamental building blocks in order to maintain the, um, the theoretical framework of the model realism. I think, I mean, this, you might not agree with that, but I think that um, those possible words can be emergent. So fundamental means, uh, as also Chris was saying in his paper, and I agree, real. And real, I mean, something can be real, but not fundamental. We are real, but we don't live at the fundamental plan scale. And I think this, this is, um, I mean, a way in which you might think, well, look, the Lewis pluriverse, after all, if it is an emergent pluriverse, um, doesn't lose his uh, distinctive feature. Now, uh, Christian, in his paper, 
he wrote a nice paper in which he really produced a set of powerful object objections, and I have no time to go over them, okay, right now. Um, there is the one I'm referring to, page nine, which is the one connected to the title. So despite, which I really like, despite its model em embarrassed the richness, uh, the Lewis pluriverse does not contain our world. And uh, this is, you say, yeah, well, if according to quantum gravity, our world is fundamentally not space and time, um, whereas uh, the identity of a possible world is a unity um, connected by spatio-temporal relation, so we are not there. So it's rich, but we are not there. And this is a powerful objection. But um, I also think, and I was thinking, of course, to the string theory landscape, that the, the line of reasoning I was developing before might partially bypass this problem. Uh, because I don't really think that the idea that the pluriverse, that the possible world is an emergent entity, uh, can be um, uh, can cost to give up on the on the, on the thesis of the plurality of the words. Um, um, I want to say something. So I think David Lewis was saying they are real feature. Okay, they, in, in this sense, fundamental is used. And, and and string theory here, what it is at stake here in the string theory scenario is not the space and time are real. Space and time are real, not, I mean, it would be a crazy theory to say, well, maybe not crazy, but it would be even harder to work to support this theory. The, the, the point at stake here is the idea that uh, I mean, that space and time are, um, are built into the fundamental structure of the physical world. They are real feature, and they are mechanical derived emergent features. And of course, I mean, I mean, it's a, it, there is nothing about the denial that space and time are fundamental that carries with the denial that these things are not in the physical world. Better they are in the physical world, just not at the fundamental level. And this is what string theory is doing. And this is the kind of lesson that I think is perfectly uh, compatible with the, the, the kind of approach that David Lewis is presenting in the variety of the words. Um, String theory is, is oh, sorry. String theory is supposed to save phenomena, not explain away phenomena. Phenomena are saved um, for reasons that I, I, I might speak for one more hour to say what does it mean to save phenomena in the case of string theory. So there is a, a last point, and I think I know five minutes are gone, right? But just thirty seconds, just to say the last point, and you will find more details. There is this. This notion of isolation, right? The trans world isolation in David Lewis. So you, you do have, there is a very synthetic trans world comparison, yes. Trans world spatial temporal relation, no. And there is a very sophisticated argument. Um, the only trans world relation allowed by Lewis is uh, that defined by the similarity order. Uh, now, which is not a spatial temporal relation, and I'm quoting one of the passages that I think. Um, is a more a really illustrated this idea that these are not spatial temporal relation across words. Now, I do claim, and this is something that it is in, a, in my previous work, um, I do claim that the non metrical relation defined on the model space local regions, which are induced by the act of deforming magical space time can really provide a mathematical rigorous counterpart to the notion of similarity order. So in this sense, string theory is not rejecting uh, at least this feature of the model realism. It is suggesting a way of revising in a more mathematical terms um, this notion of similarity order. Um, and I unfortunately I didn't I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't say more about this relation. Keep in mind that the kind of the relation, I mean, the kind of structure that you have on the model space is not the differential structure, if you like. It's not the same as the differential structure of the space time. In the sense that the model space is, um, is this, this sort of abstract space, which is, uh, parametrizing all this space time, right? Each space time has its own structure, okay? And so, uh, 
So, so a space time here is a point here, and so on. And you can define a relation among these points in this abstract, uh, in this abstract space. These relations are non measurable it's a non magical topology. This relation is based on the notion of smooth deforming. Basically, the mathematical counterpart, at least according to me, of the notion of similarity in Lewis. And, um, and I do think that um, the model space of string theory is really offering a way to, to, to read much more into the notion of isolation of uh, trans world isolation in David words, which remain more a metaphysical notion. Uh, it has to do with the notion of causality, controfactual, but this is something that can be developed on this more rigorous mathematical structure. Um, I think, is, is that done? Or, uh, oh, can I still talk? Because you are kind of a secret. Okay, should I? Okay. Well, there is a possible objection. Can I do this? Well, 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 because someone say, well, look, you were, th you were saying, um, for those who know these things more specifically, right? I, before I said, well, look, the, the smooth deformation of space-time magic is encoded by the H1, which is the first group of homology of the tangent bundle over the, for the physicists, right, in, in, this, in, in this room, uh, over the manifold. Well, look, but hey, but that is a back to space. Well. In principle, uh, this is a vector space, right? And if, I mean, uh, if you define an inner product there, you can find a metric. So maybe, maybe David Lewis is wrong, or maybe you are wrong, <laughs> comparing, making a comparison between what you are doing, David Lewis. Well, I do claim that it's neither this nor this, because the kind of, um, uh, metrical structure that you might define on the H1, on the first group of, the first group of, um, it's not group, it's, um, yes, I mean, the one form, basically, maybe it's a, a, a which are closed but not exact, the H1, um, doesn't really count as, cannot really encode, um, I mean, it, it's an open issue, but cannot really encode, um, any kind of magical relation among serious magical relation. But this is an open issue, so I, I can put that for discussion and that was it. Okay, uh, thank you, Tiziana. Uh, first, I'm just going to try to make some kind of very short kind of summary just to try to wrap it around my own head. Can I say that if I like the summary? Sure. Okay. You can say this is wrong or... But okay, okay. Let me just first finish the... So, so, so the, 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 the thing what you start with is this issue about uh, possibility of non-spatial temporal fundamentality, and that is being a problem for Lewis. And then, thinking of that might be more obvious in other approaches to quantum gravity, that it might be uh, uh, at a fundamental non-spatial temporal, but you want to push this line also for the case of string theory. And I think that is basically correct. I'm not uh, uh, criticizing that point. But now, the moduli space you're talking about corresponds uh, typically in string theory. So a, a specific point in the moduli space corresponds to something like a compactification of the target space in string theory, roughly. And um, Well, then, more than that. Yeah, but it, inclu it includes that as well. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. So I'm not saying that is the whole yeah, yeah. story. We need to just... The four-dimensional space is also included in the compactification. Yeah, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I, mean, I, mean, yes. I mean, the, I mean the yeah. whole target space. Yeah, 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 because the, the extra comp compact extra dimension yeah. are yeah. responsible. So you have yeah. the compact extra dimension, yeah. and you have the other, uh, other yeah. dimensions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, um, and then you are uh, typically often, when you have a, some kind of moduli space, that corresponds to a specific class of compactifications. So uh, it could be something like one class of Calabi-Yau compactifications yeah. on one side. 
uh, with, say, type two string theory. Yeah. And on the other side, another uh, another class of Calabiano manifolds with two feet, right? Yeah. So if you fix a, a point here, and if there is a duality, you have an equivalence mm -hmm. on the other side. Okay. So in this situation, those things are physically equivalent. Mm -hmm. And that gives us a reason, if we actually believe this to be physically equivalent, to, to not trust the prima facie spatial temporal mm -hmm. picture. Exactly. That was behind the particle yeah. quite Yeah. So what you're doing then with the with the the thing where you're not talking about duality, but rather finding a line through the moduli space where you also find equivalent yeah. situations. That's kind of a different thing. But you also yeah. find kind of a uh, there is a way of figuring out a path through the modular space that, that gives you a, the same quantum physics in terms of the outputs of, in terms of observables and, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and all correlation functions and, yeah. and all like that. And well, that's basically the summary. Is that kind of roughly yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, consider that. Hmm? Okay. And consider that, I mean, it's not that they are disconnected, that duality, they, they, yeah, they, they are treat, they're duality. connected. Yeah, because they're, you can even take... Mm, I, I, I would know. consider those lines as, as kind of self-dualities within that one yeah. patch of the modular yeah. space. You, yeah, could, yeah, you could yeah. consider that you whole could, yes. line, all points on that line are dual to each other because they're physically equivalent, right? Yes. Okay, so that's, that's just the background. Yeah, yeah. And now comes my kind of worries and... and uh, about that. So the first thing is how that uh, idea that you have lines through moduli space that explain physically equivalent situation, what well, that has to do with background independence, how that is normally phrased in. If I say DR, I mean, people are still debating how we should explicate background independence. The papers are still written on that, right? But if, if I think of DR as a paradigmatic background independence theory, and compare it to this situation, where you have a line through modular space, which basically co describes, oh, the, here is a, a, a number of points in modular space that are physically equivalent, and then hence it's not dependent on those that kind of geometry. Background. I don't see that to be the same kind of question. I think these of, these lines that you figure out through modular space, I think they are more analogous to finding out finding the gauge orbits or something like that. Um, I'm not sure about that because, um, um, okay, say more. But, say more uh, I mean, I in the sense that, more. in the sense that you you agreed that the points on the line were physically, this were physically equivalent to describe physical equivalent situations of that. Uh, so then, yeah. in that sense, uh, the physics is independent on that through throughout that line, independent on that kind of prima facie background. But, but that notion of background independence seems pretty different from the... Because you're thinking, but wh why are you restricting your attention only to self-duality? Because this is, seems your argument. You're just thinking, well, look, this is it, a case of self-duality, and so this is just gauge orbit. No, I'm not saying it's just. I'm not saying that it's it's but it's not that it's nothing wrong that it's gauge. I, I would no, consider, no, I I would <laughs> consider, I would consider also the gauge. other dual pictures as, as, as kind of roughly gauge. But I would just say that in the sense that you, if you have a number of things that are physically equivalent and identify these things, and I agree with that, and I think that's an important point of how we should try to figure out to make sense of space time and stuff. So, uh, uh, so that's one issue, and maybe we can discuss that more. The other issue, I will just briefly mention, I was kind of worried how this was connected to the Lewisian picture, because in some sense, kind of the, the you, one could consider the different solutions or uh, compact phase, you know, like possible worlds according to the theory or something like that. But wouldn't one be able to do that with any theory? And what, what is kind of specific here? So in that sense, if you just talk about uh, possible worlds according to theory, that feels very kind of not Lewisian in the sense, because Lewis tend to have some kind of, I don't like Lewis pictures, I'm pretty happy to throw that away, but, but he, he tends to have a picture where the theory and the laws and all that comes or metaphysically secondary to kind of the worlds as a starting point. And once you kind of use whatever theory you use, if you use string theory or anything else, uh, as kind of defining the worlds, that's kind of very different from, from Lewis. Well, it's, 
Well, let me say more. I mean, uh, I do agree that the laws are secondary to, with respect to the spatial temporal relation, as you were saying. But that's not the, the point. I mean, the point was to say that, look, um, it was focused on something else. But so I, I said the other way around. I said I'm that sorry. In, in your picture. So, the no, no, in your picture, you said something about Okay, no, in, Lu in Lewis pictures, yeah, in Lewis the laws are secondary. Yeah, yeah, but, but in your picture, this is it's still, you have a theory underlying which kind of defines, like, the possibilia prior. Uh, but, but, um, okay, let's, let's be more precise. The point was, um, my concern was, um, just be focused on a few things about okay. other realities, okay? This is the work in progress, and then I would, so I would happy say to skip more that, that, that aspect of right. Lewis. So, right. I was thinking first, fundamentality of space and time in David Lewis' account. Well, this is how people normally read, it's the popular re way of reading. And my, my, my way of reading was fundamental doesn't mean fundamental in the sense of quantum gravity, it means more real. Okay, and so they may be emergent. Okay, and so somehow this seems like you can bypass partially this idea that quantum gravity may get rid of David Lewis' model realist because of the physical content of quantum gravity. Then, um, the second point was, look, if you look specifically to string theory here, and I'm just talking about string theory, I think that the relation, the intertheoretical relation between string theory and David Lewis' account are different from that that you could find between any other quantum gravity approach and David Lewis. Because I think in the case you were saying, you would get rid of the views from the point of view of, of other, or, or mean, at least I read this, this paper about the fact that you really move a strong objection and you are referring to causal set theory, <coughs> if I am right. Am I, am I right? Okay. okay. You, uh, yeah, any, maybe, anyway, maybe. I, I, my point was the string theory landscape of possible world, if you like, emerging from this uh, formal structure uh, doesn't really seem to be in tension. Yeah, well. Although yeah. ignoring and neglecting yeah. for now, we are really talking about some sort of basic logic here. Ignoring, of course, other differences that you are correctly mentioning. Uh, I would say that we might use this to reread and to revise. Of course, I'm not saying okay. that modern realists can survive so as it is. Yeah. So I, w I would basically say that, that once you start from this side as a starting point, then you kind of get rid of the human, human supervenience and all that part of Lewis, which yeah, I'm yeah. happy to get rid of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so maybe then you I'll, I'll just, look, okay, just one final thing. But, but you never mentioned this kind of the thing that maybe you should spell out more, the, compare, uh, the, the, the realism aspect of the other world and how you populate the landscape in string theory that many people have talked a lot about, but you didn't address that. I didn't because uh, it is a much more complex structure than the one I mentioned about the model space because my use of the model space is really a tiny fraction of the complex land okay. landscape of use of model space. People use model space, for example, to study transition much more abrupt than just smooth transformation. Mm. And there is much more to say, but that was the time. Yeah. I mean, we could just, yeah. But this is, will be developed in the paper for the collectanus volume. So, yeah. yeah, I think, my, right, I yeah. think I've taken up more, more than enough <laughs> time. I think we'll be on. So, a question with yeah, the to the same space time. 
And if the theory is invariant with respect to this action of this group, then it has a well defined projection. So in that sense, it is background independent. In your case, what is what is this orbit? What is the orbit of the principal parable that you describe? Uh, it cannot be made by um, the object which you describe, but we can only think it's an orbit made by fibers, which are magnetic, magnetic, and equivalent. Thank you. 
inquiry, which is even related to the invariance with respect to, to the group of space time system orbit. And I wanted to see that the, 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 the action of the group of space time system orbit is represented in your equivalent.
spatial topovulation by the thing, the theory which triggers spatial topovulations. But maybe we don't know what it is. But I think it would be, would make it work a kind of uh, functionality approach. Maybe we don't need to predict some fundamental simulation. Sorry, but it was to be a short story. Do you want to say something? Thank you. 